Let's turn to Psalm 98. This psalm is just uh, a, a psalm full of praise, is really what it is, and an exhortation to sing uh, praises to God. It doesn't really have much of any message to it except that, although there are implied messages in it, but uh, the real message of the psalmist is that we should praise God because he has certainly done marvelous things. It says, I'll sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him his victory. The Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp with the harp and the voice of a psalm, with trumpets and sound of a cornet, make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth. With righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. You know, uh, this fits right in with these other psalms in the section that talk about the Lord reigning. Though we don't have the statement that he reigns, we have the statement that he judges. And the, uh, biblically speaking, judgment and reigning are the, are the faculties of, of one office. Uh, they're the province of one individual. The king judges. And he also reigns. Note that this psalm begins and ends, uh, excuse me, the same as Psalm 96. Both of them begin with a statement, sing unto the Lord a new song, and both of them end with a statement about the Lord coming to judge. In Psalm 96, verse 13, it says, Before the Lord, for he cometh, uh, for he cometh to judge the earth, he shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. And 98, and before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth with righteousness, shall he judge the world and the people with equity, which obviously is the parallel to truth in the other psalm. So the idea is, God is coming to judge the world. He is the victor over all his enemies. None of them shall be able to stand. Sin shall not be able to continue when he returns. Uh, and there are many marvelous things that he's already done that we need to praise him for. Those uh, things are listed in verses 2 through 4, primarily, uh, which, well, verses 2 and 3, basically the statement begins and ends with the statement that he has made known his salvation. Uh, verse 2 says, the Lord has made known his salvation. Verse 3 ends with the statement, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. And in between those two statements, it mentions that he's openly showed his righteousness in the sight of the heathen, and he's also remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. So, in that little couplet of verses there, verses 2 and 3, the main theme is the beginning and end of the statement. That is, the Lord has shown his salvation. And then in between it mentions that he has demonstrated his righteousness uh, publicly before the side of the heathen. And also he's been faithful in his promises to Israel. Which are, they form the basis of the exhortation for us to praise him. And then, of course, there's a reference to musical in instruments and also reference to the elements of creation, the sea, the roaring of that, uh, the floods clapping their hands, the hills being joyful together. All these elements are found in other places as well that we've already seen. Now, in Psalm 99, we get the third of the Psalms that begins with this statement, the Lord reigneth. The other uh, ones were... Psalm 93 and Psalm 97, I believe it was. It, was it 93 or was it a... No, it was, yeah, 93 and Psalm 97. And so we have the third and last of those. The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. Now, in Psalm 97, it says, Lord reigneth, let the earth rejoice. Both responses are valid in view of the fact that God reigns. Those who are righteous can rejoice knowing that he is going to judge righteously. He's going to vindicate those who have done good. On the other hand, it's an awesome thing. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God 
And there will be those who ought to be, rather than rejoicing, ought to be trembling because they are not prepared to face him as their king and judge. He sitteth between the cherubims. Let the earth be moved. Now again, that was let the earth be glad or rejoice in the previous, in the other psalm. Here the earth is moved or trembling. Uh, sitting between the cherubims is a reference to the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. On top of the Ark was a, a golden uh, lid called the Mercy Seat, which had engraved golden cherubim on each side. And God came to rest, so to speak, in the form of a pillar of cloud upon the Mercy Seat between the cherubim. The cherubim were not the cherubs such as religious art usually depicts them, little fat cheek babies, uh, like little cupids. Um, they were, in fact, uh, warrior angelic beings. Uh, it, was a cher- it was cherubim that God put at the Garden of Eden to guard the tree of life, to keep man from coming there with a flaming sword. They are guards. They're like, it, I mean, it's putting it not exactly right, but they're like God's bodyguards, so to speak. Not that he needs them, but they are like, they're pictured as the king's attendants who are there with their swords and with their uh, strength and all, and, and he sits between them, judging the earth. And so we see the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat is pictured sort of like the throne of God. He's reigning, he's sitting between the cherubim on the mercy seat, in other words. So he reigns from his temple, from the Holy of Holies on the mercy seat. Let him praise the great and terrible, let, I'm sorry, let them praise, wait a minute, Let's go back to verse 2. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the people. Let them praise thy great and terrible name, for it is holy. This is really the theme of Psalm 99, is that God is holy. We see it stated here. We see it stated in verse 5, which is a verse that we sing, which ends with the statement, he is holy. And in verse 9, which the literal word order in the Hebrew of verse 9 is, uh, holy is the Lord our God. So the stress of the psalm is clearly the holiness of God. Now, in Psalm 97, which was talking about the Lord reigning, all the cause for rejoicing was there because its enemies were going to be destroyed. The hills melted like wax before him. The fire went out and destroyed his enemies, which, of course, causes the righteous to rejoice. But even the righteous need to tremble a little bit at the thought of his holiness just because he is so lofty, he is so high, he is so different. The word holy actually means set apart or different. And he's different than we are. He's above us. He's great in Zion and high above all people, it says in verse 2. And uh, he's so high that there's a certain awe and a certain respect, a certain fear that's appropriate even for the righteous to feel about him and especially for his enemies to feel. The king's strength, verse 4, also loveth judgment or justice. Thou dost establish equity, Thou executest judgment and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt ye the Lord our God, and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Now, worship at his footstool, because of the reference to the cherubim, might refer to Jerusalem and the, and the temple. At the same time, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that the earth is his footstool. Remember, he said, Swear not by heaven, for that's God's throne, nor by earth, for that is his footstool. So we can see that where the Jews thought of the Ark of the Covenant as God's throne and thought of Jerusalem as his footstool. In other words, they thought of God only locally contained there in Jerusalem and in the temple. Jesus expanded their vision by saying, don't swear by heaven because that's God's throne. Not not the Ark of the Covenant, but heaven is God's throne. And it's not Jerusalem, but the earth is his footstool. So that uh, when it says worship at his footstool, it means, of course, exactly what Jesus said to the woman at the well. The time is coming, and now is when men shall not worship either in Jerusalem or in this mountain, but they that worship him must worship him in uh, spirit and in truth. Meaning that whereas in Old Testament times God was worshipped in Jerusalem, now he's worshipped wherever men worship him in spirit and truth, anywhere in the earth. He's not locally uh, confined to any particular place. Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among them, that call upon his name, They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spake unto them in the cloudy pillar. He kept his testimony, or they kept his testimonies in the ordinance that he gave them. Thou answeredst them, O Lord our God, thou wast a God that forgavest them. 
though thou lookest, tookest vengeance upon their inventions. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Again, worship at his holy hill in verse 9 corresponds with worship at his footstool in verse 5, suggesting again that the footstool was Zion or, or uh, Jerusalem, the holy hill. Now, uh, the reference there to Moses and Aaron and Samuel among the people may be suggesting that they were among the people, not above the people. We're told that God is high above all people in verse 2. God himself is above all people, even the greatest of spiritual people. Uh, he is high above them. And by comparison, Moses and Aaron and the great men of the Old Testament, like Samuel, they are not above the people. They, like the other people, are below God. God is above them. Therefore, these great men are seen as being merely among the people. All men stand on equal ground. Even the great men of God stand on equal ground in the sense that they all are below God and must worship him as equals, not as though some of them are perhaps intermediaries between man and God as though some men were higher than others. But all men are at the same equal ground under the Lord. And he says he spoke to them, God spoke to them in the cloudy pillar. This is, of course, when God spoke out of the pillar of cloud during the wander, wandering in the wilderness. And when it says in verse 8, uh, O Lord, our God, thou wast a God that forgavest them, though thou tookest vengeance on their inventions. It sounds kind of interesting. It says he forgave them, but he took vengeance on their inventions or on their act, on their evil acts. So it's saying that though God restored the relationship between him and them when they sinned, like Moses and Aaron, for example. Aaron uh, made the golden calf. Moses violated God's word by smiting the stone the second time. Uh, both of these men, Moses and Aaron, did evil in the sight of God, though they were mainly good men, I suppose, at least Moses was. But they did evil, and God forgave them. That is, he restored them to relationship. But he did take vengeance. He did punish them for their sins, even though he forgave them. Their relationship remained intact, but they still had to reap what they'd sown. And so Moses and Aaron, neither of them got to go into the promised land. God did take vengeance on their sins. And this is in order to tell us that the holiness of God is not to be presumed upon. Now, this psalm is about how holy God is. And we see Moses, for example... The example of a man who lived a very holy life. For the most part, we have no sin recorded against Moses. So, it, certainly the Bible doesn't imply he was sinless. But there's no sin recorded against Moses except that one. About him smiting the rock the second time. Other than that, he shines in the, in the account, in the scripture. He is clearly a holy man if ever there was one. Besides Jesus, perhaps no one could be considered to be more holy and close to God than Moses was. And yet... The holiness of God is such that he could not even ignore a little sin or what might seem like a little sin in the life of a man who generally had done a lot of good things. A lot of people feel that their judgment before God on the judgment day is going to be based on him weighing their good acts against their bad acts on maybe a scale, a, a balance, putting all their good deeds on one side and bad deeds on another and see which outweighs which. But that's obviously not it. In that case, Moses would certainly come out on the good side of that. And we, and if we thought that that was important, uh, that was the way God was going to judge, we might feel that if we did enough good deeds, it wouldn't matter if we did a few bad things because it would just actually, it would still, it still wouldn't tip the balances against us. But Moses had all good deeds that are recorded about him, but only one bad deed, but that hindered him from going into the promised land because God is so holy, he can't, cannot countenance any sin. And even though he forgave Moses in the sense that he did not damn him to hell, he was restored in relationship to Moses, nonetheless he had to uh, visit his sin in one sense, and that was by keeping him from going into the promised land. So the idea here is to put the fear of God in us. As, verse, as chapter 97 puts the joy and confidence that we have in God before us because the Lord reigns, here we have the fear of God. Let the people tremble. Let the earth be moved, and so forth. God is great above all people, and he's holy, holy, holy. Three times in this psalm, he's holy. Now we, this, this group of psalms sort of goes back and forth from jubilant, joyful songs to, uh, to awesome, awesome songs, we might say. In this case, we go to Psalm 100, which is just jubilant again, and... Uh, 
a very familiar psalm to most of us probably. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Now this psalm is primarily an invitation to come before the presence of God. We see that invitation at the second part of verse 2. Come before his presence with singing. Now, his coming before his presence to the Jewish mind meant coming into the temple. Because that's where they always associated the presence of God with was the Holy of Holies. Come to his presence. And so we find reference to his gates and his courts in verse 4, which refer to the temple gates and the temple court. So the idea is that as a man would approach God, he would come through the gates and into the courts of the temple, coming before his presence. And they'd have, he, they're exhorted to do so with joyful noises, with singing, with praise and thanksgiving. Now, for us, we realize that God is not confined to a particular temple, so there's not any gates or courts uh, of any literal building that we have to enter in to come before him. But there is his throne room in heaven. In a sense, we do depict him as a king seated on a throne in heaven. And kings are in palaces, and uh, to use the imagery of the psalm, uh, to approach a king, you come into his courts, you come into his gates. Uh, while we're not thinking in terms of the temple in Jerusalem, we can still think of the image of God, the king, in his palace in heaven. And when we pray, we're coming before him, we're coming before his presence. But that, pres that coming before his presence is to be done with singing, with praise, and with thanksgiving. Now, the statement in verse 4, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise, I've always taken to be a, uh, an order of progression. You come first to the gate, and then you come into the court. When you come to the gate, you're only at the perimeters of the property. And you go first through the gate. And then as you progress deeper into the palace and come before the courts of the king, you come to the deepest place where you, where you really... Uh, where you're really in, before his face, really come before his presence. And notice you enter his gates with thanksgiving and you come into his courts with praise. There's a difference between thanksgiving and praise because thanksgiving is simply rendering uh, words of gratitude for things that he's done, for blessings that are received by you. You, you thank him for it. It's only right that people should thank God. Uh, he's done so much for each of us. We should always be thankful. But even unbelievers sometimes are thankful to God. Uh, on rare occasions, you know, they say, thank God that it didn't rain because I wanted to play golf or something like that. I mean, that they may not even be thinking about God, really, but they would use the term thank God, and without thinking about it, they're actually, they bring themselves almost to his gate. They, they don't come into his presence. They don't have fellowship with him, but by even being thankful, if there's any thankfulness toward God there, it's like they've made their, the most rudimentary, the most initial kind of an approach to God that people can make. It's just to be thankful. The Bible indicates that unthankfulness is a sin and that it's because the people were not thankful in Romans chapter 1 that God gave them over to uh, their own lust and so forth. It says because they knew God, they glorified him not as God and neither were they thankful. Everyone should be thankful. But if you are thankful to God, that doesn't mean you've come before his presence because you only come to his gates and pass through his gates and that with thankfulness. But praise is something more, and it's something deeper, really, because praise is the expression of appreciation for who he is. Not for blessings that he's bestowed, but just who he is, what kind of a God he is. To, to know of his holiness, to know of his faithfulness, of his merciful kindness, his loving kindness and his graciousness, uh, those attributes of God... Only those who are in his presence really know, or at least those who have been in his presence before. To speak of those things requires that we be further in than just at the gates, at the borders of his property. We actually come before his presence singing praises uh, concerning his character and his goodness and his nature. And those things can only be uttered by those who know him. Uh, and so there is, a, there is a progression here, I believe. You come first to the gate 
and then into the court. Now, to come before him, uh, you know, we might say, well, how do you come before God when he's not anywhere? You know, or, or more properly, he is everywhere. Where do you go to come before him? Well, it's a spiritual approach we make, and we make it through worship, through thanksgiving and praise and prayer. And uh, I believe that, that, and by singing, that these are ways that we cause God to draw near to us and we draw near to him. It says in James, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. James chapter 4, I guess it is. It says, draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. Uh, let me turn to there just to see that there's really a sort of a re relationship between that statement and the statements we're reading. Um, it's in James 4, 8. Verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Now, the statement about drawing near to God is, is a wonderful thing because if we make an attempt to draw nigh to him, he will draw nigh to us. We remember that when the prodigal son came to himself, he decided to come back to his home and his father saw him a long way off and ran out to meet him. And I believe that when we make our approach to God, that he runs out to meet us. He makes his approach to us. There is a certain gap that we can't cross ourselves, really. Uh, we, he's in the spiritual realm. We can't go there without him coming and escorting us there. And we make our approach to him by singing, by praise, by thanksgiving. And he comes out to meet us, I believe. And in Psalm 22, we're told that he is the one who inhabits the praises of Israel or the praises of his people. So that if he inhabits the praises, you can see that when we're praising him, it's not even so much that we're moving from one place to another, but that he moves into our praises. He, he comes to inhabit them. Uh, that's in Psalm 22 and verse 3. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. So, if God inhabits our praises, then our approach to him is through praise and thanksgiving, and that's what this psalm's all about. He's actually causing us to be drawn. The psalmist is inviting us to come into the presence of God. Now, we're told in another psalm, in Psalm 16, that in his presence is fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So to come before the presence of God is, has got to be gratifying. It's got to be fulfilling. It's got to be a joyful and a pleasurable experience. Many people never come before the presence of God. Even Christians often spend very little time there. Because it's, well, we have to understand his presence. Because we know, in a sense, the Bible teaches his presence is everywhere. Uh, the psalmist said in one place, Whither shall I go to escape your presence? I can't go anywhere to escape your presence, he said. If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there too. If I take the wings of the morning and fly to the othermost parts of the sea, you're there, there too. <laughs> and so, in other words, God is everywhere. So how can it be said we have to come before his presence? Because there's two senses in which God's presence is spoken of in the Bible. One is his universal presence, which I just mentioned. He's everywhere. Everywhere in the whole universe. You can't go anywhere without being near where he is. Because Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. He is throughout his whole creation and supersedes it all and, and lives in every spot of it. But uh, he manifests his presence only in certain places and certain times. As was true in the tabernacle, he manifested his presence in the Holy of Holies. And that was what we, we wouldn't call that as universal presence, but as manifest presence, which is something different. And we want his manifest presence in our lives. We want to sense his presence. We don't want to just know that he's present because the Bible tells us so. We need to live in an awareness and in a manifestation of his presence. His presence is supposed to be known by us. I believe felt by us, in a sense though not necessarily at every moment of the day equally so, but, but that we have the privilege of coming before his presence when we have time to just 
to think on him and meditate and praise him and sing to him, then we have the opportunity and the privilege to come before him. Now, it says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all ye lands. All ye lands literally is all the earth in the Hebrew. A joyful noise doesn't just mean uh, sort of a, a tone-deaf din, uh, you know, just reverberating from people who can't make good music. But uh, it actually is referred to a, 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 a homage shout. Uh, that is a shout of people to their king, saying like, hail the king, or something like that. That would be a joyful noise. That's what the Hebrew word actually means, a homage uh, shout or a fanfare for a king. And uh, so it's telling all the earth to make this fanfare, this, this shout for God. Serve the Lord with gladness. Now, serving the Lord is something that that no one forces us to do. And, but a lot of people serve the Lord out of fear or something like that and therefore don't enjoy serving God. But it's a shame because if we are serving Him in His presence, if we're coming before His presence, there will be fullness of joy and therefore we can serve Him with gladness. Like, like the psalmist who said, I'd uh, rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Uh, that is, he was saying that he'd rather do the most menial service. He'd be glad to do the most menial service in the house of God, like being a doorkeeper, than to, to be at liberty somewhere else. That was in Psalm 84 that we saw that uh, in verse 10. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Psalm 84.10 So, there is joy in serving God in His presence. If we serve Him sort of in a... without ever coming into His presence, then it's going to be a... it's going to be a, an unpleasant experience. It's just going to be work. But if we're serving in His presence, like those who serve at the table of a king, then we will take delight in His presence because it's a delightful presence to be in. But if we don't have fellowship with him also, then of course it's not going to be delightful to serve him. It won't be with gladness. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It's he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Meaning that since he made us and we didn't make ourselves, that we belong to him, we're his people and his sheep. Therefore, it's only right that we should serve him. Therefore, we might as well serve him with gladness. If we're going to serve him at all, we might as well enjoy it. And so he says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth, the word truth there should be translated faithfulness. Fa truthfulness is really what it is or faithfulness endures to all generations. So God's faithfulness is going to endure. Well, it has already endured to our generation many generations after the psalmist lived and will endure for all generations. Now, in one place in the scripture, it says that God keeps covenant to a thousand generations. But if that was to be understood literally, it would mean that after a thousand generations, he wouldn't keep covenant anymore. But here we see that his faithfulness endures to all generations, which tells us that the number thousand is not literal, but the scriptures often use the number thousand just as a figure for a large number. As in Psalm 90, in verse 4, we saw a thousand years in thy sight are as but yesterday. Uh, a very large number from man's point of view, but not necessarily so large from God. Psalm 101 is interesting because it's David who's writing, and we've come to the end of our anonymous psalms for a little while here. Get back into some of the psalms of David. And... Uh, He's speaking as king, of course. David was king. And he's talking about, this is basically a, a confession of his resolve to keep a clean administration. You know, when you're in political power, you've got all kinds of people who try to get your favor and try to get positions of power and authority in the government, especially if you're the king and you could appoint people to any office you wanted to. There would be all kinds of uh, opportunities trying to get positions. Many wicked men. We're not content to make a decent living, but want to just get in a position of, uh, where others will give them bribes and so forth. And so there's a real attraction to high positions among wicked people with bad motives. And David, in this psalm, is basically resolving that he as king uh, will not give place to such people as that. He's going to keep a clean administration, 
uh, he's speaking basically as the head of the political machine, as one who says, I will not permit wicked men to dwell with me or to serve with me here. And so that we need to understand that as we read this psalm, it's not just a man saying, I'm going to throw out all the wicked people out of my life, but it's a king speaking about keeping his office clean of, of wicked people. He says, I will sing of mercy. Actually, the word mercy literally in the Hebrew should be translated loyalty. Uh, I will sing of loyalty and justice. Unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. O when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within mine house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A forward heart or a perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath a high look and a proud heart will I not permit. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, and they that dwell with me. I'm sorry, they may dwell with me. Uh, he that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I will early destroy all the wicked in the land, that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. Now the city of the Lord to David, of course, is Jerusalem. The city that David himself had conquered and made the, made the capital of Israel. He says, I want to cut off all wicked people from the city of the Lord. I really want this to be a holy city. Therefore, I'm not going to tolerate slanderers, liars, uh, arrogant people. It says in verse 5, he that has a high look and a proud heart. Uh, people who tell lies and work deceit. Those people won't be permitted to be part of his government. But instead, those who walk perfectly before God, uh, the faithful of the land, it says in verse 6, those are the ones that he's going to allow. And he makes the confession about his own walk earlier in the psalm. He says, I will behave myself wisely uh, in a perfect way. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. So he says, first of all, he pledges himself to, do, to be just and to be honest and to be a good king before God and a righteous king. And then he says, also those who serve with me, those who are my cabinet, will also be of the same kind of character. Now, sadly, David didn't quite live up to this, uh, nor did any of the kings that followed him. Nonetheless, God inspired this as the ideal to judge a king by. Basically, a king, this is what a king should do. And David didn't necessarily follow it altogether. All he did allow some people to be in his administration who were not the best or perfect people, like Joab, for instance. But... Uh, but we still see that he had this resolve. He still wanted to do it. We don't always live up to our resolution. In fact, very seldom do people do so. But this was, I believe, an inspired pattern for rulers and for all who are in positions of authority, maybe even in a corporation or something, where there's, where they have a, a, some authority that they can use to glorify God with. They can hire or bring in people who will make the company a blessing to God or, or bring in people who will be a, make it a reproach by their dishonesty and their greed and so forth. It's, uh, it's important also, I believe, for churches and those who choose the officers of churches to, to follow this pattern also because a lot of times churches will choose officers on a basis other than the righteousness of the person but on the basis of their financial status or their social status or some other their political power in the community or something like that but of course the same thing that David had to decide as king in choosing his assistants uh, everyone who's in the position to choose assistants must follow the same principles to exclude those who are wicked so that uh, the city of the Lord might be free from wicked doers Psalm 102, we studied on another occasion. Uh, it was a messianic psalm. And we'll go on to Psalm 103 now. Now, Psalm 103 and Psalm 104 apparently are intended to be companion psalms to each other. Uh, the reason I say that is because they begin with the same expression and they end with the same expression. They both begin, Bless the Lord, O my soul. That's the opening to both psalms. 
And uh, both of them end with that line. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise ye the Lord. Okay, so the Psalms seem to be related to each other because they, uh, they open and close with the same words. Now, the first of them is written by David. It may be the, the second one, and we know is anonymous. It may be that David wrote the second one too, uh, or on the other hand, it may be that David wrote only the first one, and later someone wanted to write a companion psalm to it and took the opening and closing lines of David's psalm and wrote another psalm to go with it. The content of the two psalms is different from each other, but the opening and closing is the same. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Now, I believe that uh, the rest of the psalm, or at least the majority of the rest of the psalm, lists out his benefits. The idea here is that David is commanding his soul to bless the Lord. Well, how do you bless God? We know how God can bless us in various ways. We tell him all the time how he can bless us. But uh, how do you bless God? Well, David said that also in Psalm 63. He said, My lips shall praise thee, thus will I bless thee. In other words, that's how I will bless you, by my lips praising you. So, to say, I'm going to bless the Lord, is to say, I'm going to praise the Lord. And uh, when he says, bless the Lord, all my soul, he's commanding his soul to start praising God. And in case your soul says, why? <laughs> in case things are going wrong, he says, I can't think of any good reason to praise God. He says, well, don't forget all the benefits that God has given you. Think of all the reasons that God deserves to be praised. Well, what are some of those things? Well, he begins to list them, starting with verse 3. He forgave all your iniquities. That's one thing he does. He heals all your diseases. Now, this does not mean there's a promise that God will heal every sickness you have whenever you want it, as some people have tried to make this sound, because David himself, who wrote this, died sick. After he wrote this, he died a sick man uh, with consumption. But um, what he's saying here is that he, at the time of writing, he had previously been sick on more than one occasion but was now well. Therefore, God had healed him in times past of all his diseases he'd ever had. Uh, he'd probably been sick many times like most of us, and at, if he was well at this point, it means that all his diseases had at some point or another been healed. Therefore, God should be praised for that, that he was enjoying health and had been brought out of disease in times past. That God forgave all your iniquities is something worth praising him for, obviously. Uh, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, and crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercy. Redeeming your life from destruction means that he saved your life on many occasions when you would have destroyed yourself. He kept you from being killed and destroyed. Uh, also, when he crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, it means that his kindness to you, the good things he does to you, his answers to your prayers, and all the things that he gives you, they sort of crown you, in a sense. That is, they, it's like... It's like his way of putting a crown on your head and proclaiming that you're one of his royal children, that you're a prince or a princess in his kingdom. It's evidenced by the fact that he shows such mercies and grace upon you. It's, it's a crowning act toward you that shows that you belong to his royal family. Uh, it says, he satisfies thy mouth with good things. Now, we know that that's not his obligation to do. He could, he could satisfy our stomachs with things that don't taste very good, and he'd be meeting all of our needs that way. I mean, if we, we just had to live off bland oatmeal all the time, uh, we could say God is meeting all our needs, but he doesn't just do that. He gives us more than that. He gives us more than we need. He gives us pleasure in it. He satisfies our mouth, meaning our taste, not only our stomach, with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle. Uh, what this is actually referring to is the belief that the eagle would be rejuvenated, that they'd become young again every time they would molt their, their feathers and, and put on a new coat of feathers. Uh, what this actually refers to in the man's life, I, I'm not totally sure, except he's just perhaps saying that God has kept you youthful and strong, uh, has not caused you to waste away in old age. The Lord executeth righteousness and justice for all that are oppressed, he made known his ways unto Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. Speaking of the law of Moses. Pardon? All right. Okay. Uh, speaking of the law of Moses, he, um, he says that God executes righteousness and justice by, of course, putting his laws into effect. 
so that justice is enforced by the legal system that God ordained through Moses. And it says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. This is almost a direct quote of what God said about himself in Exodus uh, when God caused his glory to pass by Moses and let him see his hinder parts. In Exodus 34, verse 6, uh, God's name was proclaimed before God, Moses and he was called the Lord, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. That's nearly quoted exactly like it. David borrows from that there. Uh, it's nice to know that God, though he does get angry, is very slow to get angry. He gets angry much slower than we do. As, for instance, we know that Moses, who was a meek man and didn't get angry very quickly, nonetheless got angry before God did. Uh, and smote the rock when God was not as angry as Moses was. It says he will not always chide. That means scold. He won't always scold. And he won't keep his anger forever. He won't hold it back. He'll eventually vent it and then it'll be over with and things will be all back to normal. He has not dealt with us after our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Now this is very different than Moses' statement in Psalm 90 that we read uh, earlier today. Because in Psalm 90... He was talking about how short our life is and how that it's because of our iniquities. It says uh, in verses 7 and 8 of Psalm 90, For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath we are troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. That is, it's saying that we are being punished because God is taking seriously all of our sins. Whereas here it's saying that he hasn't always done just that. He's sometimes has not dealt with us according to our iniquities. There's times when our sins would have justified God bringing severe judgment upon us. But he has not always done that. He's often mercifully forgiven us for us. <coughs> for as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. In other words, it's that much greater. His mercy toward us is that much greater than our sin. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. That's in forgiving us. God has actually put an immeasurable distance between us and our sin, which means that they won't be retrieved by us. The east, I mean, how far is the east from the west? You know, I can't really measure that. It's an immeasurable distance, great distance, in other words. That's how far he's removed our transgressions, far enough that they will never come home uh, to judge us on the judgment day because he's forgiven us of them. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Now, the reference to God being like a father here is a rare thing in the, New, in the Old Testament. There are other places, but not very many, where God is called a father to his people. But that is something that Jesus spoke frequently of, that God is our father. In fact, this very statement, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. It finds expression in a somewhat more length in the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount where he said, if you earthly fathers know how to give good things to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good things to those that ask him? In other words, the way that an earthly father cares for his children, so even more so does God care for us. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. Now, that means he remembers how weak we are. He knows that we aren't perfect. He knows our weaknesses that are built into our constitution. He knows that we were born with a sinful nature. Now, that doesn't mean he excuses us of those things, but it means that he often will grant us mercy and faith to repent, uh, give us time to repent, whereas he won't, he won't just strike out as though we were always doing things out of rebellion. Remember when Jesus told his disciples to stay awake with him for one hour and pray, they fell asleep three times. And he said, well, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He knew how weak man's flesh was, and he didn't get all angry about it either. But uh, though he does eventually get angry, he's slow to wrath because he remembers how weak and frail creatures we are. He knows our frame. Uh, he remembers that we're just dust, really. As for man, his days are as grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. The same idea we found earlier, man being transient, also from Psalm 90. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. To such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. 
The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. That is, over all the universe. You know, in the Hebrew, it's over the all. That's a strange expression. That's why the King James translators took out the word the. It ruleth over all. But it actually, in the Hebrew, God ruleth over the all. And the all meaning the sum total of everything, the universe. Uh, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength and do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So there's a call to praise God and to bless him. First he calls upon his own soul to do so and reminds his soul of all the good reasons to do so, all the good things God has done that he needs to be praised for and thanked for. But then, having uh, made all those declarations, he calls upon the angels to bless him. And then all his armies, verse 21, his hosts and his ministers and all his works. At this point, the cassette tape was stopped and turned over to record on the second side. As I said, it begins and ends like the other one, but this has something different in it. And it might not be evident if it's not immediately pointed out. And that is that it goes through the days of creation, really. And it shows how everything that is created is dependent upon God. It, uh, it talks about the creation of light in the first two verses. In verses, uh, the second part of verse two and on through verse four, it talks about the second day of creation, the creation of the firmament, above the waters below and above the firmament. Uh, verses five through seventeen talk about the third day, that is the, uh, the dry land appearing and the vegetation appearing. Then verses uh, 19 through 24 talk about the fourth day, the stars and the moon and the sun, etc., uh, being created. Then verses 25 and 26, the sea creatures, which were created on the fifth day. And verses 27 through 30, uh, it just states that all these things were dependent on God. So the idea here is that it runs through the creation story of Genesis 1 in poetic language, however, uh, and sort of maps out the various things that God did in creating the known world and, and it, its inhabitants, and then states the, how each of us, created by him, are totally dependent upon him. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who covereth thyself with light as with a garment, who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain. Now, the heavens was the firmament of heaven, according to Genesis. So, he clothes himself with light as a garment, which alludes to the first day of the week. The stretching out of the heavens is like the uh, second day of the week, the firmament. Who layeth the beams of his...